We come to the fourth oral question, uh, Lord Cormac. Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Lord Bethel. My Lords, we're absolutely committed to making sure that everyone gets two doses. So if they have received their Pfizer first dose, they will get a Pfizer second dose within 12 weeks of the first dose. Similarly, if they have had their AstraZeneca first dose, they will get their AstraZeneca second dose within 12 weeks. The four UK CMOs and the JCVI agree that prioritising the first vaccine dose will protect the greatest number of at-risk people overall in the shortest period of time. Lord Corbeck. My Lords, I naturally thank my noble friend for that answer, and I have just returned from the very efficiently run County Showground Vaccination Centre outside Lincoln, where I've had my first dose and have been given a date for my second. He has certainly reassured me on the government's determination both to give the same vaccine and at the right time, but is he aware of the findings in Israel where there's been an extremely impressive rollout of vaccination, which, seem, which has cast considerable doubt on the wisdom of delaying the second dose. And this has caused a great deal of concern, not least in your Lordship's house, voiced by both Baroness Boothroyd and Baroness Bakewell, among others. Can he please give us some reassurance that there is no danger of diminishing the efficacy of the vaccine by delaying the second dose? Well, I'm uh, extremely pleased to hear the update from my noble friend. And can I say thanks to all those in Lincoln who are contributing to the effective um, vaccination uh, of my noble friend and uh, his uh, second appointment, which is very reassuring. Can, can I reassure him that on the Israeli numbers, um, Sir Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific officer, has been very clear and was on the media round this morning. The Israelis looked at a very specific time period, 14 days, and they looked at a very specific age group. This is very different to the um, analysis done by the JCVI and by the MHRA, which looks at all age groups over a much broader period. 89% is uh, thought to be the efficacy uh, of immunity from days 10 to 21. That is a very considerable and impactful effect. And I have spoken to the noble Baroness, Baroness Boothroyd, to reassure her on this matter. Uh, Lord Anderson of Swansea. My Lord, the rollout of the first vaccine has gone fairly smoothly, although there have been glitches or lumps and bumps, particularly in terms of regional disparities. What lessons have been learned, and what was the reason for choosing 12 weeks? Is it administrative, medical, or supply? <clears throat> well, my Lords, uh, there have been uh, glitches. I don't know if there are lessons learned, but I can share with the Noble Lord that the practicalities of getting, particularly the Pfizer vaccine, which, as he knows, requires deep, cold storage, uh, into every, every part of the country is quite challenging. Uh, and uh, we are trying to reach not only the big mass centres, but also into community uh, pharmacies and into GP surgeries. The delivery of the vaccine to uh, thousands and thousands of locations is always going to be a little bit uneven. And there have been occasions where we've deemed it the correct procedure to have people stood up for their vaccination, even though we weren't 100% sure of the delivery of the vaccination, which does create concern, but I think has been the right approach to take. A bonus jolly. Well, Lords, my question follows that of Lord Anderson of Swansea. Uh, for many in isolation, the appointment for their first jab is all that has kept them going. And the certainty of timing of the second has changed since the introduction of the vaccine regime. Could the Minister tell us whether that is to do with the region, there seems to be problems in the southwest, or is it demand, logistics or science? Well, I was, um... Uh, if I understood the noble Baroness's question correctly, uh, can I uh, reassure her that uh, absolutely everyone's details are registered uh, in the National Immunisation Database, so everyone will receive an invitation for their second dose, as I um, uh, mentioned earlier. But the reason for taking this longer uh, period over the second dose is completely pragmatic. My Lords, every 250 doses saves a life. So it's absolutely essential that we get the maximum number of first doses out as quickly as possible. 
Now, the MHRA, the JCVI, and others have looked at the safety and efficacy of this approach, and they have found reassuring evidence that this will work extremely well indeed. My Lords, I take great joy in the fact that we have found a way to get the most number of doses to the greatest number of people as quickly as we possibly can. Lord Ribeiro. My Lords, mindful of the impact of the COVID-19 on frontline health staff during this pandemic, and given the report in the Times today of reduced supplies of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine during January and February, may I ask my noble friend, the Minister, what plans are there to ensure that these front-facing health staff in hospitals and care homes are prioritised as a matter of urgency to protect them from the pandemic? As someone in his late 70s who is waiting for the vaccine, I'm happy to forego mine until such time as the health staff I mentioned are protected. Well, I'm enormously grateful to my noble friend's um, important gesture uh, and, and pay tribute to his generosity of spirit for it. But it's absolutely essential he gets his vaccine as soon as he, as he can, because he is at the top of the list. Morbidity is determined by age, not proximity. Healthcare staff are, of course, of deep concern to all of us, but those in PPE and who are in uh, protected conditions have no greater chance of getting the disease than general members of the public. And what is essential is that we put those who have the highest risk of morbidity, the oldest, at the front of the queue, and that's why we have the prioritisation list that we have. Uh, Ms. Campbell of Surbiton. My Lords, um, I'd like to thank the, uh, the hard working noble Lord, the Minister, and his government for listening to the most clinically vulnerable groups and reprioritising vaccination for all care workers ensuring their greater safety. However, I am concerned that people under 65 with learning disabilities through living care homes are in Group 6 rather than Group 1, when ONS data clearly shows they've been disproportionately affected throughout the pandemic. So it's illogical that they now have to wait longer than other people with learning disabilities, older ones in residential care. So what plans do the government have to ensure consistency and fairness in vaccination allocation to all people in residential care, especially for this category of people? Well, my lords, uh, no balance puts put her point very well. And, and there's a huge amount of sympathy and concern of, towards those who have underlying conditions. And she is right that their ONS data uh, on those with underlying conditions uh, does demonstrate uh, a higher hospitalisation and mortality rate. And that is why we've put all individuals between 16 and 64 with underlying health conditions, which put them at a high risk of serious disease and mortality, higher up the prioritisation list uh, than others. But, noble lords, it is age, age more than anything else, which is the greatest determinant of mor morbidity. And that's why the list looks, looks, looks like it does. My Lords, I'd like to ask the Noble Lord, the Minister, about those who are housebound and bedbound. Because if they're domiciliary workers and they're care workers and their unpaid carers are vaccinated in centres and with their GPs, what arrangements are in place for home visits to vaccinate this particular cohort of people who cannot leave their homes because of their disability or their particular conditions. It has been rumoured there is no intention to vaccinate this cohort at present, which I find remarkable. So I'd like the Noble Lord to assure the House that arrangements are being made for this particular cohort. My Lord, I'd like to reassure uh, the Noble Baroness it's absolutely not our intention to leave those who are housebound uh, out of the scheme, uh, not at all. In fact, they, they are uh, a very important priority. Um, they are logistically a big challenge. We are in a numbers game. We are trying to uh, get the greatest number vaccinated as quickly as possible. But we are working extremely closely with community pharmacists and with GPs to try to figure out the way in which we can get the vaccine to those people who can't make their own way to the vaccination centres. Those um, uh, plans are uh, in advanced progress. I don't have details of them to hand, but I'd be glad to write to the Noble Baroness with those details. My Lords, um, may I ask the Minister, how concerned are the government 
that diminishing efficacy in partially immunized people amongst a population with high prevalence of the disease, like we have in the UK, will foster ideal conditions for the virus to mutate into vaccine resistant forms. I don't quite agree with the premise of the question, which is the concept of partially vaccinated. When you get your first vaccination shot, you are vaccinated, your body has been primed, the B cells make the antibodies and you learn how to fight the disease, and, and that is the categoric. But where the Nobel Baroness absolutely has a point is that it's an uncomfortable truth that when we lean into the virus, it will seek to escape and mutate, and that is the moment of uh, absolute highest risk for the country. Uh, that is why we are trying to move as quickly as we humanly and possibly can, because there is a, a moment in time, an opportunity to get the vaccine out to as many people as possible to avoid uh, the mutation from throwing up uh, variants that escape our vaccine. Uh, Lord Mann. There were a few voices uh, last spring and summer suggesting that the National Health Service wasn't good enough and that a privatised service would have been better in dealing with the pandemic. They're remarkably silent now. Uh, would the Minister join with me in the celebrations across this country at the moment of the brilliance of the National Health Service and the fact that people going to be vaccinated are going with a smile on their face, welcomed by people, volunteers and staff with a smile on their face, all saying how brilliant our National Health Service is? Well, my Lord, I'm enormously grateful to the testimony uh, of the noble Lord. Um, I, I would probably put it slightly differently. Listen, we're in Act 1, uh, and I don't think it's quite the right moment to take curtain calls uh, and bows quite yet. The NHS has stepped up to this challenge absolutely magnificently, but there's still a huge amount to do and a huge amount to get through. Um, in addition to, to the praise that he gave, right, quite rightly gave the NHS, can I, though, also uh, pay tribute to other parts of uh, the government, particularly uh, the army, to local authorities, uh, and to the private sector that contribute the vaccine in the first place, all of whom have worked together in a great spirit of collaboration. And it is only through that spirit of collaboration that we've been, been able to deliver what we have.